As we've been traveling through the Gospel of Mark, uh, I want to remind you of what we studied two weeks ago. And we looked at a story where Jesus and his disciples, they had just sat down to a meal in one of the local religious leaders' homes. And it tells us that there were some Pharisees that had come down from Jerusalem. These were like the big guys from the big city. And they were coming to investigate Jesus because to them, he was saying and doing a lot of controversial stuff. And so it, sh- it shares with us that they were present at this meal and they observed something that offended them. They were offended that Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. And they used this terminology. They said, why did your disciples not wash their hands, making them impure? And what that tells us from their perspective is they believe because they did not practice this human tradition, which they had equated to God's word, they believed that it made them impure before God, meaning they were not thankful, they were not honoring God as they were going to eat a meal. And we looked at how toxic religion is where we add to the Bible, not just take away from it, but we add things to the Bible that are not actually there. Toxic religion is something that is harmful, where we add things, and by doing that, we burden the people of God to do more than God requires, and it ends up hurting people, and it isn't something that just happened then. It's also something that still happens today, and I ventured into some controversial waters as we talked about that. You loved it. I know you did. From tattoos to drinking to, you know, we just touched on it. I held back a little, I want you to know. But Jesus used that moment, and it was a very tense one, in the face of offense and opposition. He used that to teach a lesson, which is something he shares many, many times throughout the gospel. And that is this, he is more concerned about the heart than external action. And that's what we need to be reminded of as well. He's always looking at the heart, and he's telling his followers, he's telling the Pharisees, and he's telling us today, he's looking at the heart. He's concerned about the heart. And I think it's interesting that now as we open up into verse 24, following that story, that Jesus leaves that region where I believe he's being rejected by his own people. He came to the Jewish people, and he's being rejected for things that are not even written in the word. And after this rejection, he makes his way into a Gentile region where they deem them unclean. But isn't it interesting how Jesus, after talking about what's clean and unclean, now goes to this seemingly unclean region and will find what happens as people reach towards him for the grace that he has. But here's what the Bible says as we follow along in the story in verse 24. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs." But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of the answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. Going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed and the demon had left. And again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon and the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him. That word means begged. They begged him to lay his hands on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd and by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with saliva and looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, I don't know how to say this to be really honest with you, Ephatha, Ephatha, Ephatha. That's how you say it. Ephatha. It's Aramaic. That is be opened. I tried to practice it too, but it's gone. It's gone. Ephatha. Be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. He gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all these things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. About two years ago, I decided to I say I because I don't know that it was a we decision, just to honor my wife uh, today. 
You'll see why. <laughs> About two years ago, I made a decision to take down two large trees that were in, the front, uh, in our front yard about 22-foot cedar cypresses, and they were right in front of our windows. For some reason, when they took them down, I did not have the stumps removed because I thought or I figured in my mind that I would be able to dig them out myself. (laughs) It's about what they look like. There were two of them. I affectionately refer to them as Ahab and Jezebel. (laughs) They're where we're living today. A few months later, I went outside with a shovel and a pickaxe, and I started to dig them out. The first day, I was real optimistic. I had a lot of faith. (laughs) The second day, I was losing the faith, friends. But the third day, I was resolved that there was absolutely no way that I was going to be able to do this in my own strength. And I'm ashamed to tell you today, the truth is, they sat there for about two years. And the whole time, we needed to fix our front yard. We needed to plant things so that they would flourish and that this would look nicer than our neighbors thought that it might. Fortunately, it was tucked in a little bit. But I didn't fix the yard, and I left it there and had great intentions. But this, these stumps became a living metaphor for obstacles that require more than my strength. It seems to me, as, as I look back, that It's kind of funny because this is what life is like at times. I try to deal with something only to lose faith, uh, but the reality is, is I was probably doing something that we all do is that I had misplaced my faith by putting it in myself. I thought I could do something that I just simply could not do, and we all experience situations and seasons like this where problems that we face are just simply bigger than what we can manage alone. And I'm talking about things like a sick body or a depressed soul or a wandering mind, maybe a struggling child, maybe a struggling adult child that's not walking with the Lord. What about a divided house, a divided spouse maybe, where you're in conflict, or you have a suffering friend that you love very much and you can't do anything about, you just seem to be stuck there. We as the people of God need faith for supernatural breakthrough because what we are saying as we gather around God's word is not just that these things exist, but that God is greater than these things. And even when we can't do something about what we face, we believe that God can. When we don't have, we believe in a God who does have. When we can't do, we believe in a God who can do. And these things in our life often are not just reminders of the lack of strength or our inability, but they are also reminders that we need something and someone greater than ourselves to step into those situations and help us to excavate or remove that which we face. Now, I know that you're itching and wondering about the stumps. Well, this is what happened to them. So... A friend from our church, I don't know if he's here today, but uh, he owns a couple tractors, and I got in touch with him from somebody else here, and uh, he offered to come and uh, and take these out for me, and and he did. And I want to tell you how I felt about this, by the way. When this large tractor entered onto my lawn, all of a sudden, the faith in my heart (laughs) began to rise. I'm talking like faith began to rise. I was singing all the victory songs I could find. I mean, it was just, there was no way that this th- these things were not, Ahab and Jezebel were coming out this time for good, definitively, effectively, powerfully. They were about to be gone. And in minutes, friends, in minutes, what I couldn't do at all, this thing was able to do simple and no problem. And this became to me a living metaphor of Jesus' power in comparison to the obstacles, obstacles that I face. And so I share it with you. And I'm bringing this up because in our passage today, we encounter two people that have problems that require supernatural breakthrough. And friends, I'm certain that you and I also are facing similar things. We need God's power in the midst of what we face. And I want to tell you something. He has the power. God can bring supernatural breakthrough just like that tractor for those stumps. And we observe something very special in the two people that I'll bring up in this passage as we study through the verses, and that is we see that they had faith. 
and they put their faith in Jesus. They probably exhausted all of their belief in their self, knowing that they could not do this in and of themselves for themselves, but they put their faith in Jesus and they saw him do what only he can. And so I want to share with you a few points today in order to strengthen our faith. And the first one uh, is this in verse 24, and, and that is, we must hear testimonies of supernatural breakthrough. We must hear the testimonies. Look at verse 24. Jesus got up and he went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he could not escape notice. But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now Jesus and his disciples had traveled about 40 to 50 miles northwest into the region of Phoenicia. And there are these two ancient Canaanite cities. And I just wanted to point them out today. And I got my little laser pointer. I love it. I love it. Somebody bought this for me. Thank you. I don't know who it was, but thank you. You must have been saying something. But Jesus, you can see, this is the home base of Jesus right here. This is their, they're, they're around the Sea of Galilee. We see him go over to Bethsaida. We see that. And then once he went over to here in the book of Mark, but they go all the way up over to here on foot. Why is that helpful? Because we're going to notice how there's no internet or email or, or simple connection. I mean, the way that news spread was word of mouth. I mean, these are port cities, Tyre and Sidon. So the word of Jesus had to spread far and wide in order for people to hear about him. But there's something very fantastic about this story that draws our attention to the faith in this woman. Now, let me remind you, this is a, a place where Jews would be uncomfortable. Jews and Gentiles did not get along. Gentiles were looked down on by the Jewish people. And there are multiple reasons for that. I'm not going to go into that uh, today, but there was a hostility and Jews were uncomfortable. The disciples were uncomfortable when Jesus went into this region. It's an entire region of Gentiles. They went out of Galilee, and now they're into Phoenicia is where they're at. It's, it's an, and all these old Canaanite cities, there's a lot of history for them to have these conflicts. And Jesus goes into this house with his disciples, and the unnamed woman, she found Jesus and fell at his feet seeking freedom for her demonized daughter. And we can acknowledge today that there's nothing worse than watching your kids suffer. So we can imagine that this woman had done everything that she can. She, there's nothing I bet she, she didn't already try. She's exhausted and depleted her strength. Her coming to Jesus is not probably the first thing that she did. She's a worshiper of other gods. She's not just a Gentile. She's from an ancient Canaanite city. They worshiped other gods. They served other gods. She was not Jewish. She didn't understand the Ten Commandments. She did not practice the sacrificial system. She did not travel to the temple to offer her sacrifices. She was outside of everything that the Jewish people would celebrate and understand about the old covenant. But she comes, and why does she come? Because verse 25 says she heard about Jesus. That's all that it took. After a person had literally exhausted themselves, they hear about Jesus and they come. Well, what did she hear about Jesus? She heard that Jesus healed a paralyzed man somebody that had been paralyzed since birth. She heard that Jesus had healed somebody that had leprosy, multiple people that had leprosy. She heard that when people came to Jesus, that he healed everybody that came. I mean, the word had traveled far and wide that Jesus silenced the seas, the megastorm, the regular seas, that, 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 that Jesus would minister to the crowds and he multiplied five loaves and two fish. Friends, nobody did anything like this. They don't know anybody like this. And so the word traveled 50 miles. She heard these stories. That's all that could be told during this time. And that's all that it took. She heard the testimonies and she came to Jesus. What about the woman with the issue of blood? What about Jairus' daughter? He can resurrect the dead. Wow. You know, for the desperate, testimonies are like food to the starving. They release hope. They provoke us to action. She just didn't hear good stories. She came as a result of what she heard. It reminds me of Psalm 34 and verse 8, one of my favorite verses, probably one of yours. And the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Well, he wouldn't have written that unless he knew something or experienced something in God that he believed was so good everybody else had to have. And don't you love it when somebody's trying to sell to you their favorite restaurant? 
You know, they're like, whatever it is, let's just say, I like pho. I love to eat pho. And I love the fact that Fedra Way has a lot of really good pho places. I just love that about Fedra Way. Sometimes people talk down about Fedra Way. They don't know about the pho. <laughs> that sounds mildly inappropriate for a second there. I, I, don't know. I don't know why. But anyhow, I love pho. It's one of my favorite dinners. And so if somebody's telling me about a pho restaurant and they're like, man, this is amazing. This is wonderful. I mean, there's it brings me to a place of action. I hear the testimony, you understand? I'm the type of person, and I bet you're this way as well, I don't go anywhere until I look on Yelp or Google reviews. It's just the way that I live. Because the Bible says that there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. And we have effectively figured out a way to help each other not have a bad experience. Or for the most part, sometimes when I read those Yelp reviews, I'm like, this person is not one of the wise counselors that I want, right? I mean, there, there are people that are just trying to get Google stars or they're really mad. I, I'm not really sure what they're doing, but not very helpful. But you can get a consensus as to whether or not this place is worth your time and your money. See, I love that. I love, I love to hear the testimony. And it brings me to a place of action where what? I go to eat. And the psalmist says, come, taste and see. He doesn't just say hear and know. Friend, I'll tell you what. If we want to experience the living God, we get to taste and see. We're not just supposed to hear and know. We're supposed to taste and see. Testimonies provoke something inside of us to say, the same God that did that for you can do it for me. That's what testimonies do. The same God that did that for you can do it for me. Maybe if we hear one testimony, it doesn't do much. But all of a sudden, we start to hear two and maybe three. And now by the fourth one, we're thinking, well, maybe God is doing all that because skepticism is a normal part of our culture. Isn't that right? I mean, unbelief is being handed out like free candy. Just unbelief all over the place. And so what we're doing is when we get together because we are a believing people, we are a people that believe in transcendent truth, that there is a supernatural God who can do what we can't do. We believe this, we're not a cessationist church, and I'm not sure if you knew what kind of church you walked into today, but by the time I'm done, you will know. We believe that God still does today what he has always done, and testimonies are fuel to those of us that are seeking God, that are asking for him to do it, if not for us, through us, for the loved ones that we're praying for. This is what we need and what we know. Testimonies are stories that God uses to stir our faith. I'm so thankful for what God is doing in our community. I've heard three stories, actually, over the last six months or so of people that have been asking God uh, to, to give them a baby. And they hadn't been able to do that for several years, some maybe two or three, some less, some longer. I have a friend who, him and his wife, they were trying to get pregnant for 11 years. And at the end of that time, they decided to adopt and so they finally officiated their adoption, and right before they, they were able to receive their child uh, that they were adopting into their home, guess what happened to them? Yeah. So they had two children now all of a sudden, and it was just a miracle of God. And I can remember my friend at year 10 even just kind of bowing his head, not in defeat, but just saying, would you pray for me? And I remember looking at him thinking, man, you need to pray for everybody else because the kind of faith that is required for you to still contend at year 10 is something that most of us just don't know. See, friend, sometimes we think that faith is, is best seen when victory is obvious. And that's not true. Faith is seen by people standing in a place where they're believing God, even in the face of where something has not yet happened. Friend, that is faith. I have a friend who believed that God was gonna heal him from cancer and he went to be with the Lord. And there is no person that I know that has had more faith than that man. Even when he went to be with the Lord, he went in faith. And I love that because he was a living testimony, an example to me of what it looks like to stay bent toward believing God no matter what it looks like. And friends, those testimonies we need just as much where we see people stay faithful and true to God even though they didn't get what they were asking for. How many of you know that's a great testimony in God's house today? God can even do that for us because we need to be fixed and focused on him and not believing all the other reports. Those things might be our reality and we acknowledge them. I'm not word of faith movement. I don't just do, I think I can, I think I can. We live in the reality, but we believe God's supernatural reality even in the face of it. That's what the scriptures call us to. Have you ever sat and read the Bible and just thought, wow, that happened. And then you realize he's still the same today. The, the verse that we 
adhere to and that we preach a lot as Foursquare churches. In fact, it's part of our bylaws to have in our sanctuary. We don't yet have it. I'm thinking about putting it up here, like one of these right here. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe that Jesus is the same. Well, you know what the enemy wants to do, though? He wants to discourage us when we've prayed for something and it hasn't happened. He wants to discourage us to not be around the people of God. He wants to get us into a place where we're isolated so that we're not around what the Lord is doing. Friends, I want to tell you something. There's an opposition, especially in the Northwest. I'm sure, especially here. We don't live in the Bible Belt, you know? It's like in the Bible Belt, everybody goes to church, even people that aren't Christians. They, we, just, we just go. It's just part of your belt, I guess. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> I've never lived in the Bible Belt. But anyhow, in the Northwest, there's an opposition for us to even come together, for us to even come together and be a part of what we call the, the gathering together of the Lord. There, there's something set against us. And the enemy wants to sow into our life to discourage us away from the people of God, from fellowship, from the Bible, from prayer, from intimacy in our relationship with him. Because the closer that we get to him and the closer that we get to his word and the closer we get to other people who are also reading his word and believing his promises, the more our faith is gonna get stirred and the enemy gets defeated because we're believing God God and not everything else that's so, so going to discourage us. Isn't that right? And so today, what do we need? We must hear the testimonies of the Lord. Part of gathering together, I walk into here sometimes discouraged. Friends, I see a lot of stuff that happens that I'm not excited about. I experience those things just like us. And I walk into this room and I'm saying, Lord, renew my faith. I'm saying, Lord, do it in me just like you're doing it in them. And so whenever I hear somebody experiencing God's work and his spirit working in their lives, I celebrate, amen. I celebrate, even if it's not for me, because I believe that if God did it for them, he can do it for me. And we need to be a people that rejoice with those that rejoice. Yeah, we wanna lament with those that lament as well, but I'm focusing on the rejoice part today. We need to rejoice with those that rejoice. So if the Lord moved in someone's life, we say, amen. We don't add our discouragement or our skepticism where somebody says, I've been freed from alcoholism and nobody knew that I was struggling with that and God set me free. Well, the thing that might come into some of our minds because skepticism is a normal part of our culture is, yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. We need to slap that thing right out of our mind and send it back to where it came. Because all that's doing is continuing to allow that, that perpetuating of cynicism and skepticism. There's a healthy questioning. There's a healthy, I don't want to say skepticism, but there, we get doubts. We do ask questions. We're all about that. Ask questions. Ask hard questions. Dig into God's word. I mean, we want our faith to be robust, not superficial. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying this world will strip it away from us if we're not careful. And so testimonies will stir up a faith to believe God for supernatural breakthrough. And the second part of this is we must pray for supernatural breakthrough. It just, we don't assume it. We have to pray for it. Look at verse 26. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And here's the part. She kept asking. This terminology is she was asking and she kept asking and she kept asking. She was annoyingly asking. She kept asking, not just to get Jesus' attention, but to get Jesus' answer. She said, you've got to cast the demon out of my daughter. Now, Matthew's account of the same story shares something a little different. It says that when she fell to her knees, she cried out. Everybody say cried out. When you see something in the Bible where a people or a person, they're going through or they're up against something they know that they cannot defeat. The Bible will reference prayer in this terminology. They cried out to the Lord. That's what they did. That means that they prayed really loud. That means that they prayed really desperately. Have you ever had to pray with desperation? Have you ever got a little louder than maybe you used to in your secret place? <laughs> Have you ever had to go to war in intercession because something was so vexing you that you just had to get louder than what was happening on the inside of you? Well, friend, I have. And if you haven't hit something like that in your life yet, you're going to. And it says this woman cried out. You know what she said? She said, Lord, have mercy on me, son of David. She's a Gentile. She's not a worshiper of God. She's only saying what she heard. She didn't know this because of the Ten Commandments. She didn't know this because of the Old Covenant. She, she only knew to say this because she heard it from someone else. She said, Lord, have mercy on me, son of David. I didn't grow up learning about David. I didn't grow up learning about the law. 
but I believe what other people said about you, and you, you can do what you did with them, then you can do it with me, and you are who they say you are. You are Lord. You are the son of David, and I'm changing religions right now. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? That people in our world that we're trying to bring to Christ through apologetics were a Muslim or perhaps a Hindu or a Buddhist, where they hear that Jesus is moving and Jesus is alive and Jesus is working and they simply come to him because they hear of his power. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And our our apologetic would be the prophetic or our apologetic would be like, do you want to meet Jesus? And they're like, well, if Jesus is like you say he is, absolutely. I mean, that would just be a wonderful thing. And I, I believe we can come back to those days where we see that in the word and we could see it in our lives as well. Now, this is, to me, a a profound picture. It's a profound picture of a desperate prayer on behalf of a child. What does it look like? It looks like this, maybe she's a single mom. We, We don't see the husband. Where's the husband? You know, in that culture, women did not have standing in that sense. Praise God that it's changed, but that, that was the truth, and so her husband would have to stand in front of her, or her firstborn son, perhaps, but she's there, and she's on her knees crying out. This is the picture of desperate prayer, of what it looks like when you're facing something you don't know what to do with. Look at verse 32. This is where the man who was deaf and mute, it's a different story, but it's in the passage that we're reading. It says, they brought to him. The deaf and mute man did not come to Jesus. Obviously, Uh, This is not something that he did. He didn't hear the testimonies. So he needed his friends to bring him to Jesus. And it says, they brought to him, they brought to Jesus, one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored Jesus to lay his hands on him. They brought their friend. They begged Jesus to lay his hands because they believed that if Jesus touches our friend, that what's wrong will be made right. That's faith. That's incredible faith. And for us, we don't have the physical Jesus here with us today. And so we pray in the name of Jesus. And it is still the same. His power flows as we pray. And that's why Jesus would teach his disciples in preparation for him ascending and sending the Holy Spirit. He would say, if you pray according to my will and you pray in my name, my father will grant it. Why? Because physically I'm not going to be with you. But Jesus was promising that the same things that you're asking me to do, watching me do, and I'm giving you power to do, that if you pray in my name, those same things will happen as I. I go and ascend to be with the Father. This is a powerful picture as well for people bringing their friend to receive a supernatural touch. Now, I believe this, that our faith starts strong, but sometimes through many prayer sessions, it can wane when we don't see something happen. As a pastor, I see this quite a bit, but I would tell you that faith is not static, it's active. It looks like something. To have real believing faith means that we're crying out to God. That's why these stories are pictures for us of what faith looks like. When the gospel writers were writing down an account of Jesus' life and ministry, I have to believe that the Holy Spirit was leading them to put these stories in the Bible, not just as a historical account, but as a living witness of what it looks like for you and I to come to God in faith and believing Him for what He still does today. In my role as a pastor, one of the things that's happened to me is I've come under greater and greater conviction with each year that I have to be a person of prayer and that we must be a people of prayer. It was a year ago I came back from a vacation. I think it was a staycation is what it was. Anybody know what a staycation is? You got more month than money. That's what that is. And we read like catalogs during our staycation. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? And then we went outside to play badminton. That's what we did. (laughs) And we're competitive. So uh, anyhow, all right. I came back. One of the things that the Lord told me when I was away, when I was seeking him and praying during that time, was that you need to be more of a man of prayer than you are, number one. And number two is you need to lead Northwest Church into a place of prayer that they'd never been before. Now, so what did we do? just because you're asking, well, how are we going to do that? One of the things that we did is we started pre-service prayer before three of our services because I was just trying to strap them conveniently so that more people could come. And that's exactly what has happened. So we start our prayer at uh, 8.15 a.m. before this service. 
4.15 p.m. before the Saturday night and 6.15 p.m. We're going to actually shift it to 8 a.m., 6 p.m., and 4 p.m. because we want a little bit more time so that we can get out towards the service. And, uh, you know, this is an unashamed pitch. Why do I do that? I do not do that because that's the system and the structure that the church ought to abide by because, oh, yeah, we should pray before the service. Friends, I'm not doing it for that. I'm not doing it because that's what we used to do or that's what we ought to do. I'm doing it because I'm under conviction. And I wanted just to make it more convenient. I would do it on a Friday night if we had to. I mean, I would do it on a Saturday morning. I'm, I'm open. We do have morning prayer, 6 to 8 a.m., Tuesday through Friday. We have that as well. We invite you to that. But this is not where we're stopping. This is only where we're starting. Why? Because we cannot assume that God is going to move. We must pray for God to move. We have to ask God. We have to seek God. We have to call upon the living God and cry out to him that these things in our world begin to change. And I want to testify to you today that as we have begun to pray, we have seen God do things in our midst specifically just as we have prayed them. I've got a whole list of things that we've been praying about, but one of the things I have specifically prayed about and we are seeing happen is I have prayed that the kids that were in our youth group, the kids that were in our youth group years ago that have walked away from the Lord and walked away from faith, that God would send them back to our church. And he's been doing that. There's a young man that comes to this service. I don't know if you're in this service, but the first time I met him, he walked up to me and I said, you don't know this, but we've been praying for you. He said, what? What? (laughs) I said, you don't know this, but we've been, he thought I knew his name and all that. I didn't. But my point was he used to go to our junior high group. And when Ryan was talking about reaching the next generation, one of the ways that we can do that too, is we can begin to pray and cry out to God because we believe when we can't, he can. Have you felt helpless for this next generation? I mean, with all the statistics that were read, there's so many more that we could read about. Friends, we're not called to read the news. We are called to read the word and cry out to God that he can change it. And that's what we're believing for today. Absolutely, God can do it. But it's gonna come because the people are not only believing and we're hearing the testimonies, but we're praying and we're crying out to a mighty God that can do what we cannot. He can change things. I wanna stir your faith to that. Supernatural breakthrough is not normative for the average believer, but it can be for the praying believer. How do we know that? Because we have it written down here. Prayer cannot merely be our lifeline. It has to become our lifeblood. It is the people that we are. Leonard Ravenhill said this, and I'll give you no disclaimer, although if you read his book, you can't walk away without feeling like a sword cut you. He said this in his book called um, Why Revival Tarries. He said, books on prayer are good, but not enough. As books on cooking are good, but hopeless unless there is food to work with, so with prayer. One can read a library of prayer books and not be any more powerful in prayer. We must learn to pray and we must pray to learn to pray. While sitting in a chair reading the finest book in the world on physical health, one may still waste away. So one may read about prayer, marvel at the endurance of Moses, and stagger at the weeping of Jeremiah, and yet not be able to stammer the ABCs of intercessory prayer. As the bullet unspent kills no game, so the prayerless believer will see no breakthrough. (laughs) Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Do you know what I think happens? I think sometimes when our life is going okay, we don't recognize our true and deepest needs of more of God in our life, number one. But number two is the more isolated we become, the further away from other people we become, the less in touch with the needs around us we are. And so here's the thing, it's like my life might be going okay, but if I start to roll my sleeves up and I get into the lives of other people, all of a sudden I see people that are stuck, struggling, and suffering. And I know just like those stumps, I can't take a pickaxe to their life. There is not much that I can do, but if I can call on the heavenly tractor, I know that he can dig the stumps out of the ground of people's lives. And God can simply do that. And maybe my job is to come alongside those who maybe are going through something that I'm not going through and say, God can do it. God can bring a breakthrough. God can do something about your situation. It's to help people to believe. I'll tell you, that's a task for the hour that we're in. 
It's to cause people to look up and not just look across or look down. I want to tell you, that's a work in the Lord, and we need his endurance and strength to continue to point people to a God that can answer. He says, boldly come before the throne of grace. What does it look like to boldly come before God's throne? I think we're seeing a picture of it today in Mark 7. It looks like a woman who has no standing before the Jewish people or before a first century rabbi, especially when the disciples say this about her, send her away. You should read Matthew's account, Matthew 15. The disciples, man, the disciples, (laughs) send her away. She's annoying. Send her away. We don't want her to keep on doing this. She's negotiating with Jesus. It says she kept on asking. Wow. But our third point is also just as important. We must persist for supernatural breakthrough. Look at what happened. He was saying to her, verse 27, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord. She was not offended by this at all. She understood what he was saying. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, because of this answer, in Matthew's account, it says, your, Jesus said, your faith is great. He said that two times throughout all the gospels. He said, your faith is great. Because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. This is a picture of persistence in the face of seemingly opposition. She did not get a favorable answer, but she persisted anyways. She was insistent. She was tenacious. She didn't give up. She did not give in, even though she got a strange answer. Jesus said to her, let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take their bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, this woman is a Gentile. It says of the Syrophoenician race. We know that she's, uh, anciently speaking, she's a Canaanite. She doubts God. She doesn't worship God. And she comes before Jesus. The disciples say, send her away. Jesus listens to her. Some of the Jews, they would say about Gentiles that they were dogs. And so it almost looks very offensive here when you hear her say this. It's like, why would, or see Jesus say this, why would he say that to her? Why would he affirm what sometimes uh, is, is the word of hostility uh, between one race and another? Why would he affirm that? Well, he didn't affirm that. Most theologians would tell us that there are two Greek words, or at least two Greek words, that are used for the word dog. The first one is kuon, and it means scavenger dog. That's essentially what that would mean. So like in Philippians, isn't that terrible? I'm sorry. In Philippians, uh, it'd be like a street dog. In Philippians 3, 2, you remember when the Apostle Paul says, be on guard, watch for the dogs. Oh, he's using this word there. And every other negative reference in the New Testament, the Greek word is kuon. It's talking about street dog, scavenger dog. They had lots of them during that culture. But when Jesus said, it's not right to give to the dogs, this is kunarion, and it literally means puppy. Yeah, see? It helps to know that this literally meant puppy. You check it out. Most theologians completely agree with this. And they teach it this way. Jesus' words were not insulting. They were insightful. It was an issue of order. It was an issue of value. When you read the Bible closely, you capture a focus on Israel with the inclusion of Gentiles through the gospel. But why is this the case? Have you ever wondered why there is this emphasis on Israel? Well, I want to tell you why. I want to make it very simple. God chose, Yahweh God chose Israel out of all the nations, not because they were the greatest, but perhaps because they were the least. And he chose them and he committed himself to them to bring forth his purpose. It was to them that he brought the law and the covenants and the temple and the sacrificial system and the prophets and ultimately the Messiah. He gave them promises which are perpetual. And we, as the people of God, we honor those covenants, those promises that God has given. We do not believe in replacement theology here. And so this woman was not insulted. She understood what he meant, but she persisted anyways. She understood. She wasn't insulted, so you shouldn't be when you read this. She said, yeah, but I know you can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. It was a metaphor. It wasn't a label. 
I know you can't do that, but listen, even the dogs, even the puppies underneath the table eat the crumbs. And so Jesus hears her say this, and he's astonished of what comes out of her mouth. He says to her, woman, you have great faith. Your faith is great. It shall be done for you. I mean, this is so easy for a person to give up. And we read this story, and sometimes I think it's easy to kind of walk away from that and, and not maybe be as encouraged as I think we ought to be. Friend, this is a story of a desperate person who's crying out for God to set her daughter free. This is what it looks like. You say, what does God want me to do when my kids are suffering and struggling? He wants you to do that. What does God want me to do when I've got family members that are sick and, and going through something? He wants us to do that. One of our friends in our church, maybe he's watching, he's not here today, but he found out that he needed a triple bypass surgery. And I was talking to him at, uh, his family's here, I was talking to him at one of our, um, right before a service a couple weeks ago, and uh, he was struggling like I would be struggling, he was, but he was believing God, you know? And um, so I dragged him into the prayer room so that we would pray over him, you know, first of all, because it's, you know, something that you have to walk through. I've, I haven't had to go through that. Here's how I felt when I was talking to my friend, a member of our church. As I'm looking at him, I'm, I'm literally feeling like I have nothing that I can do to change this for you. But the second thing that I was thinking was, let's ask God. Let's ask God. So we went into the prayer room and we, and we prayed and I looked at him. I said, I can't do anything but this. I will fast with you. I'll fast with you starting tomorrow. And I thought, as a pastor, what can I give to him? I don't just want to slap him on the back and say, everything's going to be okay. I said, I could fast with you. I thought, that's what a good pastor would do, right? Amen. So that's what I did for the next couple of days. I fasted with, with our, my friend and a member of our church who was facing something that he didn't think he would have to face. And the same is true for you. If you're going through that, hey, let's, let's pray, let's fast, let's get on our knees together. You, you have a, a struggling or a suffering child right now? You have something, you have an adult kid that's walked away from the Lord? Friend, you know what we need to do? And this is what I felt in my heart today is that there were people in this service and your kids have walked away from the Lord. And you read this story and, and you think, man, I really, I wanna cry out for my kids. I'm not, I'm not necessarily gonna ask you to come up to the altar and kneel, although we could do that. We'd be, probably be here a long time. We've got another service, you know. And I want those moments. We need those. Kind of come back to Jesus moments. Renew our faith moments. Give him all of our hearts again moments. We all need that. But I thought, man, we need to rededicate our children to the Lord today. We need to rededicate our children to the Lord today. Let's put them back up on the altar, just like we saw young Ezra. He was up here this morning. And the Bible says in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they get old, they will not depart. You train them up when they're young. You believe that when they're old, they won't depart. But what the Bible doesn't say is God makes an intercessor out of the parent between young and old. Amen. And so as we come together, what we're not going to believe is what we see maybe in our kids that are walking another way. What we're believing is that God will honor what the Word of God says, that they, in their age, as they begin to get old, they will encounter situations in life that will turn them back to Jesus. You say, well, Ben, I, you don't know where my kids are right now. You're right, I don't. But I know what God can do. And that's not false hope. That's not misplaced optimism. That is faith in God's ability to do what we can't. Would you stand with me today? This is what I would like to do, and I want to make a comment here. Um, we have a couple minutes in the rest of the service, so if, I just want to ask you to settle for just a second. I won't take you very long. We have kids we got to pick up. <laughs> we don't want to keep them. We just want to teach them. That's it. You know, amen. <laughs> and we want to love and you understand? We got four, so. Um, moving forward, I'm under conviction that we need to spend a little bit more time in response in our service. So what I'm going to start doing uh, at the end of the message, in the same amount of time that we have for a service, is we're going to carve out probably seven to ten minutes of uh, allowing the Lord to touch our hearts and Maybe it's not something that's related to the message. Maybe it's what we walked in here with or simply what we need God to address. But I'll tell you, we need worship. 
We need the Word, and we need Holy Spirit ministry. And it's a missing component, co- component a lot of times, and we do it on Wednesday all the time, but I want to bring part of that into our service. And here's what I'm saying. I just want to start to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. I want to start to have a time where the Lord can bring stuff up and we just simply respond to Him and we pray over each other. It, it won't be uh, like get into groups per se and you won't feel uncomfortable, but just we're waiting on the Lord together. And I, I believe that's what should mark us as a people. That if, it, if we're good at anything, it's prayer. Isn't that right? Because we know we need God. And so that is something that you'll, you need to know as we continue to grow as a church. It'll be maybe seven minutes. I'll stop the message and then we'll ask the Holy Spirit to move. I was praying earlier and I felt this commitment from the Lord. I really do. 9 a.m. This is 9. I pray before every service, before the 9 a.m. service, that um, someone has, you have adult, adult child, a son or daughter, and they're not walking with the Lord. And here's what I'm asking you, and I'm making a commitment to you. I, I felt this from the Holy Spirit just leading me. If you'll fast with me on Wednesday, this Wednesday, let's pray for breakthrough, supernatural breakthrough. And so if that's you in the room and your kid's not standing next to you, because that would dishonor them, <laughs> could you raise your hand where you're, that's you and you're saying this week, Ben, I'll fast with you this week. I'll pray. Yeah, I'll take you up on that offer. You fast in whatever way you need to fast. I'm not trying, there's no control here. It's just a commitment. Will you fast and pray with me this Wednesday? Okay, I'm contending with you. Yeah, okay, all over this room. Now let's dedicate them to the Lord right now. Father, we thank you for our kids We put them into your care. They belong to you. And we say over them prophetically, you belong to Jesus. Because we're standing in this room today, Lord, in your presence. And we are asking you to surround our kids with your loving care. God, we are crying out to you and we are praying for their deliverance. We're praying for their healing. And most of all, we're praying for their salvation. We don't care how you reach them, Lord, but we pray that you would reach them. And Lord, maybe right now all we can give to you is our prayers, and that's what we will. But also speak to our hearts about what maybe we could do or should do, even if it's out of the box. But Lord, we put them into your hands, and we ask you to move mightily and powerfully. And Father, I pray this Wednesday over every one of us that we're raising our hands for our kids, because we know we need to. This is something that you put on our hearts. I pray, Father, that you would help us to engage you to bring a supernatural breakthrough In the name of Jesus, we pray for that and we dedicate them to you right now. Thank you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts. Sensitize us to what you're saying and doing. I was praying for somebody today and um, I know this sounds a little strange probably, but I'm going to say it to you the way it came to me. Um, You own a business and potentially you own other ventures. You have a lot of things going on and you feel that your heart has just gotten more and more divided, and you feel conflicted, and you know you need help, but you almost don't know what kind of help that you need. I need help with this, and I need help with that. And when you hear what the Lord is saying to you, you feel this conflict in your heart. Like, I want to do some things that God has put on my heart, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to fulfill that. It just kind of continues to be this sort of empty thing in your life. You want to fulfill it, but you can't seem to get there. And I want to tell you today that the Lord wants to give you words of wisdom. I, I, want, you to, I want you to hear this. He sees you. He knows that you have multiple things. He's going to help you consolidate. He's going to help you simplify so that you can get to what matters to your heart the most. He sees you today. So if that's for you, receive that word from the Lord and just ask him for words of wisdom. Or maybe you have not been able to figure it out. God will help you to sort it out. He can do that. He will do that in Jesus' name. And also for somebody, I had this word of knowledge where like you have a a hip issue. There's something about your hip and it's not quite right and it's causing you some pain. It's really more like uncomfort and um, it's also affecting probably your sleep. Is that anybody in this room today? It's something about your hip. Yep. All right. So there's a couple of us. And so if this is you right now, and also if that word was for you for the business, let's just receive that from the Lord today. I'm going to pray and close. Father, we thank you. We come to you right now. Holy Spirit, we pray. Minister to our hearts. We pray for those that are experiencing the hip pain, whatever that is. Also for someone's ankle. There's something about your ankle that's 
not quite right. It's not healed yet. It hasn't been healed. Lord, we speak your healing power over them in the name of Jesus. Come in this room today by your presence and release the gift of healing. Father, we pray that you would move powerfully. Heal the hip, heal that ankle, Lord. And also for the one that has the business or many ventures, we ask for words of wisdom just to get downloaded into their heart so they can get to what matters the most. Father, we receive what you're doing. We thank you for it. And we ask for even more in Jesus' name. Amen.